brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that supports life and family. 5% of your monthly plan price goes to your favorite charity. Buy the way you believe at CharityMobile.com and use promo code TRADITION. Blessed Holy Saturday. We have today the continuation of our series with Father Reginald Garagou Lagrange, and it's on an appropriate message from him. It's a analysis of the virtue of humility. Humility has a, an ex- inseparable link to Good Friday, as Father Lagrange will illustrate for you here. He uses our Lord's sacrifice on the cross as an example of humility, and his teaching should help us to understand possibly where it is we lack in the humility in our own lives and what we can do to remedy it, including some prayers and some other things that we can do. But of course, much of it begins with our attitudes. And you will find, I suspect, that most of us are lacking in this virtue. This is not surprising. I know for myself that I'm not surprised that I am lacking in humility as much as I should have. It's an unpopular thing to say, but if you are the kind of person who believes that you should have your opinions posted on the internet for potentially millions of people to view, and that your opinions merit such attention, there is a very there is a possibility that you lack the a sufficient virtue in humility. And Father Lagrange gives us as just wanted to use that as just one example, but Father Lagrange gives us a good reflection on how to use to use the faith in a way to use the treasures of the faith to correct such inclinations without also turning our backs away from responsibilities God has given us and gifts that God has given us not to shy away from great things but to also how to embrace them in a spirit of humility humility is one of those virtues lacking sorely in the modern world we are told to not be to not to have humility but to be prideful in fact, to be prideful in some great evil things. As summer approaches, I am sure you understand what I mean by that. So here is Father Garagou Lagrange on humility in light of the cross. Have a blessed Holy Saturday. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. See Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Since we are speaking primarily about the moral virtues that have a special affinity with the theological virtues and the life of union with God, it is necessary to reflect on what humility should be in those who wish to become proficient. The importance and nature of this Christian virtue demonstrate to us the gap that separates the acquired virtues described by pagan philosophers from the infused virtues of which the gospel speaks. Throughout the entire Christian tradition, this virtue has been considered the foundation of the spiritual life. It is a foundation insofar as it separates us from pride, which, according to sacred scripture, is a principle of all sin because it separates us from God. Often humility has been compared to the foundation that must be excavated in order to construct a building. The higher the desired building, the deeper the foundation has to be. The two outstanding columns of the temple to be raised are faith and hope, while charity is the dome. Certainly, humility should repress pride under all its forms, including intellectual and spiritual pride. Yet the principal and most elevated act of humility is not precisely the actual repression of acts of pride. In fact, it is clear that in our Lord and the Blessed Virgin, there was never a moment of pride to repress. There was in them, however, the uninterrupted eminent practice of the virtue of humility. What then is a distinctive act of humility with respect to God and neighbor? The distinctive act of humility consists in bowing down toward the ground, from the Latin humus, from which the name of this virtue is derived. To speak without employing a metaphor, this unique act consists in abasing oneself before God and before that which is of God and all creatures. To abase ourselves before the Most High means to recognize our inferiority, our smallness, and our indigence, not only theoretically but also practically. Even in the state of innocence, we would have been conscious of this, but after sin, we became aware also of our state of misery. Thus, humility is united to obedience and to religion, yet it differs from them. Obedience regards the authority of God and his precepts, while religion respects his excellence and the worship and adoration due him. Humility, in making us bow down toward the ground, 
acknowledges our smallness and poverty, and in this way glorifies the grandeur of God. It sings his glory as did the archangel St. Michael when he said, Who is like God? The interior soul experiences a holy joy in reducing itself to nothing, so to speak, before God, so that it may recognize in a practical way that he alone is great, and that in comparison to his majesty, all human grandeur is empty of truth, like a lie. Humility conceived in this manner is founded upon truth, especially on this truth, namely that there is an infinite distance between the creator and the creature. The more we realize this distance in a living and concrete way, the humbler we are. However elevated a creature may be, this chasm always remains infinite, and the more we elevate ourselves, the more evident this becomes. Hence the most elevated is the humblest, because he is the most illumined. The Virgin Mary is the most humble of all the saints, while our Lord is much humbler than his mother. The affinity of humility with the theological virtues can be seen by taking into consideration its twofold dogmatic foundation which was unknown to pagan philosophers. It is based, first of all, on the mystery of the creation ex nihilo, which the philosophers of antiquity did not know, at least not explicitly, yet which reason can know with its natural powers. We were created from nothing. This is the foundation of humility according to the light of right reason. Under this aspect, it is a question of acquired humility. Here we are concerned particularly with infused humility. Such humility is based on the mystery of grace, on the need for actual grace in order to perform the least act helpful for salvation. This mystery surpasses the natural powers of reason and is known only by faith. Our Lord expressed it in these words, Cut off from me, you can do nothing. See John chapter 15 verse 5. In the order of salvation. From this certain consequences flow relative to God, the Creator, His providence, His goodness, insofar it is the source of grace, and His goodness insofar as it causes forgiveness of our sins. First of all, regarding God the Creator, we ought to acknowledge not only abstractly, but practically and concretely, that we by ourselves are nothing. My substance is as nothing before you, O Lord. See Psalm 39, verse 6. What do you have that was not given to you? See 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We were created from nothing by a fiat of God who is sovereignly free, and we are held in existence by his benevolent love, without which we would be annihilated in an instant. Although after creation there are diverse beings, nevertheless, reality, perfection, wisdom, and love are not increased because infinite wisdom and the fullness of divine perfection already existed even prior to creation. Besides, if all that comes from God was taken away from our most perfect free act, nothing, strictly speaking, would remain any longer, since this act is not produced in part by us and in part by God. Rather, the whole is from God insofar as he is its first cause, and the whole is ours insofar as we are the second cause. In the same way, the fruit of the tree is holy from God as the first cause, and holy from the tree as the second cause. This must be acknowledged also in practice. Without God, creator and conserver of all things, we would be non-existent. In the same way, without God the supreme provider, without his providence that directs all things, our life would be totally lacking in direction. Consequently, we ought to receive with humility both the general direction of his precepts to attain eternal life, and the particular direction which the Most High has chosen from eternity for each of us. This particular direction is manifested to us by our superiors, the intermediaries between God and us, to whose counsels we should have recourse, and by events, as well as by the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we should humbly accept the position, perhaps very modest, that God has willed for each of us from all eternity. Thus, it is that in the religious life, according to the divine will, some ought to be like the branches of a tree, others like the blossoms, and still others like the roots hidden under the soil. Actually, the roots, even if hidden, are more useful than the other parts, since they draw from the soil the substance which makes the sap that is necessary for the nourishment of the tree. If all the roots were taken away, the tree would die, while on the other hand, it would not die if all the branches and blossoms were removed. Humility, which induces the believer and the religious to accept willingly a hidden position, is very fruitful not only for themselves, but also for others. In his life of sorrows, the Savior humbly sought the last place permitted Barabbas to be preferred to himself, and chose the scorn and shame of the cross. Precisely for this reason in the building of the kingdom of God, Christ became the cornerstone. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? It was the stone rejected by the builders that became the keystone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. See Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. St. Paul writes to the Ephesians, 
So you are no longer visitors. You are citizens like all the saints and part of God's household. You are part of a building that has the apostles and prophets for its foundations and Christ Jesus himself for its main cornerstone. See Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. Such is solid humility, marvelously fruitful, which even in the most hidden places sings the glory of God. It is necessary, therefore, to receive humbly from God the special direction that he has chosen for us, even though it has to lead us to a profound immolation. It is God who gives life and death. He leads us from one extreme to another. He humbles us and exalts us as he wishes. This is one of the most beautiful light motifs of the Bible. Since we are unable to take the last step forward or accomplish the least salvific or meritorious act without the help of actual grace, and we especially need it to persevere to the end, we should humbly ask for this grace. Even if we are possessed of an elevated degree of sanctifying grace and charity, ten talents, for example, we would still have need of actual grace for the least salvific act. Particularly, we have need for the great gift of final perseverance for a happy death. We should humbly and confidently ask for this every day in the Hail Mary. With St. Paul, Christian humility joyfully says, Not that we are qualified in ourselves to claim anything as our own work. All our qualifications come from God. See 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. And, It is for that reason I want you to understand that on the one hand, no one can be speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit and say, curse Jesus. And on the other hand, no one can say Jesus is Lord unless he is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. See 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. In a word, humility ought to acknowledge in a particular way and more each day the grandeur of God, creator and provider of all things, the author of grace. This humility, which recognizes our indigence, must be found in all the just. It must also be found in the innocent man. After sin, however, we must acknowledge not only our indigence, but also our misery. The misery of our wretched and egoistic heart, of our inconstant will, of our irregular, violent, and capricious character. The misery of our spirit, which commits unpardonable forgetfulness and falls into contradictions that it can and ought to avoid. And the misery of pride and concupiscence, which leads to indifference concerning the glory of God and the salvation of souls. This misery is less than nothingness itself, since it constitutes a disorder, sometimes throwing our soul into a state of abjection that renders it worthy of contempt. The miserere of the divine office often reminds us of these gentle truths. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your great goodness, and according to the greatness of your compassion. Wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt and of my sin. Cleanse me, for I acknowledge my offense, and my sin is before me always. Indeed, in guilt was I born, and in sin my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop, that I may be purified. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Turn away your face from my sins, and blot out all my guilt. A clean heart give me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew in me. Give me back the joy of your salvation, and your spirit of holiness take not from me. Yet who can detect his own failings? Absolve me from those that are hidden. How much different this abasement through humility from that cowardliness born of respect and spiritual sloth. Pusillanimity, contrary to magnanimity, flees from necessary work. Humility, far from being opposed to grandeur of souls intimately united to it. Thus the true Christian ought to aim at great things, worthy of a great heart. Yet he should aim humbly, and if necessary, run the course of great humiliations. He must learn to say often, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. The pusillanimous is he who refuses to do what he can and ought to do. He can also sin mortally when it refuses to do what is obligatory. Humility, on the contrary, bows man before God, to put him in his true place. It does not abase us before God except to enable him to act more freely in us. Far from being discouraged, the humble soul places itself in the hands of God. And if by means of it the Lord does great things, it does not boast. Just as he acts in the hands of the woodsman, does not boast, nor the harp in the hands of the artist. It says with the Holy Virgin, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. See Luke chapter 1, verse 38. On this subject, St. Thomas, in a manner as simple as is profound, says, Each one ought to acknowledge that, in what he possesses through himself, he is inferior to all, the, to all that every other person has received from God. Every man of himself has nothing other than his indigence, defectibility, and deficiency. He ought to acknowledge not only theoretically, but also practically, that all he has from himself is inferior to all that every other person has from God, both in the order of nature and that of grace. The holy doctor adds concisely, 
The true humble man considers himself inferior to others not because of external acts, but because he fears he may be accomplishing even the good he does through hidden pride. For this reason the psalmist says, Yet who can detect his own failings? Absolve me from those that are hidden. Or better, purify me, Lord, from my hidden faults. Moreover, St. Augustine says, Believe that other persons, though in a hidden way, are better than you, although you seem to be morally superior to them. Again, with St. Augustine, we must say, There is not a sin committed by another which I would not commit because of my frailty. And if I have not committed it, it is because God in his mercy has not permitted it and has kept me in the good. Sacred Scripture says, Lord, create in me a clean heart and a steadfast spirit. Convert me to you, and I shall be converted. Have mercy on me, a sinner, because I am weak and poor. See Psalm 51. St. Thomas writes, Since the love of God for us is the cause of all good, no one would be better than another if he were not loved more by God. What do you have that was not given to you? See 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. This induces the saints to say to themselves on seeing a criminal condemned to the ultimate penalty. If this man had received the same graces that I have received for so many years, perhaps he would have been less unfaithful than I. And if God had permitted in my life the mistakes that he permitted in his, he would be in my place and I in his. What do you have that was not given to you? This is the true foundation of Christian humility. All pride should be smashed under this divine saying. The humility of the saints thus becomes more and more profound because they come to know better and better their own frailty in contrast to the grandeur and goodness of God. We must always aim toward this humility of the saints, but we should not employ the formulas they used until we are profoundly convinced of their truth. Otherwise, it would result in a false humility, which would be, in comparison to the true, what rhinestones are in comparison to a diamond. Humility towards one neighbor, thus characterized by St. Thomas, differs immensely from human respect and pusillanimity. Human respect is the fear of the opinion and the anger of the wicked. This fear separates us from God. Cowardliness flees necessary work. It withdraws before great things that are to be accomplished and inclined towards pettiness. Humi humility bows us in a noble way before God and before what is divine in our neighbor. The humble man does not give way to the power of the wicked, and in this he differs, says St. Thomas, from the ambitious man who abases himself more than require, required for attaining what he wants, and abases himself slavishly to attain power. Humility does not flee great things. On the contrary, it reinforces magnanimity, making the latter aim humbly toward elevated things. Humility and magnanimity are two complementary virtues that are to sustain one another like the two arches of a vault. These two virtues appear splendidly in our Lord when he said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. This is humility. And to give his life as a ransom for many. This is magnanimity, with a zeal for glory of God and the salvation of souls. It was not possible for our Savior to aim at anything higher, or to tend toward it with greater humility. He wished to give us eternal life, and to accomplish this he chose the way of humiliation, the passion, and the cross. In due proportion, these same two apparently contradictory virtues are united in the saints. Thus the humble John the Baptist did not fear the anger of Herod when he said to him, What you are doing is not lawful. See 1 Matthew chapter 14 verse 4 and Mark chapter 6 verse 18. The apostles in their humility have no fear of the opinion of men and are magnanimous even to martyrdom. There is something similar in all the saints. The more humble they are, the stronger they are, and the less they fear human opinions, however much they are to be feared. Such is the humble St. Vincent de Paul, fearless before the Jansenist pride, which he denounced in order to conserve for souls the grace of frequent communion. Without humility, it is impossible to have the perfection of charity. Then what, practically speaking, do we have to do to attain the perfection of humility? Above all, it is necessary to maintain the correct attitude with respect to praise and reproach. Regarding praise, we must not command ourselves. This would be to soil ourselves, as the proverb says. He who acclaims himself stains himself. Those who praise themselves find that they are never praised enough by others. We must not seek praises, for we would make ourselves ridiculous and lose the merit of our good works. Finally, we must not be complacent with praises when we receive them. We could lose, if not all, the merit of our good actions, at least a flower of merit. Concerning reproaches, we ought to accept patiently those we deserve, especially when superiors the right and duty make them. If one becomes sulky, the benefit of this correction is lost. 
Sometimes it is also fitting to accept patiently a reproach that is hardly merited or totally undeserved. St. Thomas, when a novice who unjustly corrected for an error in Latin while reading in the refectory, he corrected himself as he was told, but during re recreation he, su his surprise confers asked him, You are right, you read well. Why did you correct yourself? And St. Thomas replied, Before God it is better to make an error in grammar than to be lacking in obedience and humility. Finally, it is good to ask for the love of contempt, remembering the example of the saints. When our Lord asked St. John of the cross, What do you want as a reward? He answered, To be despised and to suffer for your love. His prayer was heard. A few days later, in a very sorrowful episode, he was treated as an unworthy religious and in such manner that it is hard to imagine. St. Francis of Assisi said to Brother Leo, if, arriving late at night at the convent gate, the brother porter does not wish to open up for us, but takes us to be thieves and beats us with a stick, leaving us all night in the rain and cold, it is then that we ought to say, What perfect joy! What joy, our Lord, to suffer for you and to become a little like you! The saints praise themselves to this point. St. Anselm has excellently described the levels of humility. 1. To acknowledge that under certain aspects we are worthy of contempt. 2. To accept being so. 3 to confess that we are so. 4. To wish that our neighbor believe this. 5. To bear it patiently when it is said of us. 6. To accept with, without reserve, being treated as a person worthy of contempt. And 7. To wish to be traded, treated in this way. These superior levels are described in all the books on piety, but as St. Teresa says, they are a gift of God, they are supernatural goods. They suppose a certain infused contemplation of the humility of our Lord, who was crucified for us and a living desire in us to become similar to him. It is certainly fitting to aim at this sublime perfection, yet few are the souls that attain it. Before attaining it in the interior soul has many occasions to remember the words of Jesus, so simple and profound but truly imitable, at least in a relative way. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the deepest humility, united to the noblest grandeur of soul. One of the most beautiful formulas in which humility and magnanimity are reconciled is this one taken from the works of St. Thomas. The servant of God ought always to consider himself a beginner, and always to tend toward a more perfect and holier life, without ever stopping. And that was Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange's teaching on humility using sacred scripture. Probably hard for us to hear. But for Good Saturday, or Holy Saturday, it's appropriate, I think. Let me know your thoughts on this in the comments. I am curious what to see what you have to say. Do his words hit close to home for you? Do they challenge you? I hope so, in a way. That everything that we've gone over with Father Lagrange during Lent has proven fruitful. And let me know again in the comments if you would like us to continue with this series after Lent. Where we still have some more of Lagrange's writings on the subject of the love of God to go through. So let me know what you think about that in the comments, please. And thanks to the patrons for their support of this channel. I was able to get this book with their support. So thank you very much to the patrons. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.